Hello everybody, welcome to my March wrap up. The first book I have to talk about is The Way of Edan by Philip Chase. And this is a book dealing with the Holy War. There are multiple villains in this story. It has a quest journey, it has found family, prophecy, um, amazing female characters. I did do a spoiler free review of this book and a lot of people have been talking about this book and how it has a lot of traditional fantasy elements, a lot of history and lore, um, a very detailed map that I think is very carefully executed into the story as far as like geography and language, that kind of thing. But I think one thing I don't hear a lot of people talk about is about the Buddhist elements in this story. So I did title my review Elves and Buddhism because I guess because I am familiar with Buddhism, I have spent some time in Buddhist circles and I have read uh, books on Buddhism. I was familiar with that inspiration and those elements in the story, but I don't really hear a lot of people talk about it, so I just wanted to mention it here. But if you want to hear more of my thoughts, I do have that spoiler filled or spoiler free review, I should say. And uh, if anybody's confused by the elf ears in that particular video and that thumbnail and how I keep referring to myself as an elf, uh, the story behind that is that I met Philip at ICFA last year in Orlando with Alan from the Library of Alexandria, Jimmy from the Fantasy Network, A.P. Canavan from A Critical Dragon, uh, Steven Erickson, Steven Donaldson. It was amazing. But after that particular meeting, Philip did a video on his channel called I'm So Sorry Jimmy. So that might provide some context, but he ends up calling me or identifying me as an assassin elf in that video. And he also referred to me as an elf. Before that, I did a tag video he tagged me in on 25 things about me, something like that. I'll link that video as well. And so he seemed to think of me as an elf. And at first I thought that was a very endearing thing. And then I found out that elves are in his trilogy, which he's been working on for 18 years or so. And they are, <laughs> they're not the kindest creatures to put it mildly, but that's where that comes from. But anyway, I did find the elf parts of this story, my favorite parts of the story. And the way it ended made me so excited for book two. So again, you could check out my spoiler free review if you want to hear more of my detailed thoughts. But also, if you want even more Edan content, I have some here on my channel. I hosted a fantastic discussion on The Way of Edan with Philip Chase, with the lovely Murphy Napier, with Alan from the Library of Alexandria, who's doing the narration for this particular trilogy, and Jimmy from the Fantasy Network, and we had such a fun time. And the first 34 minutes of that discussion are spoiler free. You can hear Alan give away <laughs> the voice for Day Raven, which is hilarious. And you get to see me get my heart broken when I ask about how songs are going to be handled in the narration of the audiobook as well as my question to Philip about elves in this trilogy, but um, it was a fantastic discussion overall. Philip did the thumbnail, which I greatly appreciate. But anyway, I hope that you are able to watch that video. If you've read or not read the book, I really think you'll enjoy your time with it. Um, we are planning to get that group back together for books two and three, so I'm very much excited about that, and I'm so happy for Philip because he's just wonderful. <laughs> he's just one of the most kind and special friends I've made here on booktube, so just so happy to celebrate him and his book. And then the next book I have to talk about is A Little Hatred by Joe Abercrombie. This is book one in the Age of Madness trilogy. And I have heard before that Abercrombie gets better and better with each book he writes and that this Age of Madness trilogy is the best of the best when it comes to Abercrombie. And I don't think people are kidding about that because wow, I was impressed. So I have been a First Law fan for some time. I did love the original trilogy, but I'll be honest, the first book, The Blade Itself, didn't win me over so much. I wasn't even sure I'd continue the trilogy after that first book, but got convinced after hearing more praise for Abercrombie. But then the second book, Before They Are Hanged, I always say that book changed me as a reader because that was the first time when I realized that I didn't even care about the plot because I loved the characters so much and the character interactions and combinations in that particular story. Not to say there isn't a plot, there very much is a plot in the first Law trilogy. I'm just saying that I wasn't even so preoccupied with where the story was going. I just lived for every moment with the characters. And so I think obviously Abercrombie is brilliant with character work, but I think it got even stronger in this book because not only is every character amazing in this book, but even every side character, and we have incredible female characters, and just the incorporation of like character development and theme 
and intersecting perspectives and things happening in the story. I think it was just so masterfully done. And speaking of female characters, I love this because this deals with war and revolution and about the, you know, industrial age coming upon us and how that's affecting mankind, probably not the most positive way. And so there's this wonderful quote here, though, that about the great change, as it's called, and it says, so funny, whenever men talked about freedom, they never really meant for the women. And so I like that. I, and there also is some beauty commentary in here too, um, which I enjoyed. And I also just loved, um, Abercrombie is known for writing very good action scenes. And there was one particular action scene that, oh man, his humor is so good. Um, but there was this one particular action scene where the character is getting very full of adrenaline and battle glory. And you know how it is with Abercrombie. If you've read any Abercrombie, anytime a character gets haughty, you know it's all gonna go south. So I just loved that. And I just had such a great time. It was just so entertaining. And I'm very curious to see where this goes from here. So A Little Hatred by Joe Abercrombie. I did immersion read this with the narration, with Stephen Pacey's narration, because he's amazing. But I always like to have my eyes on the page as well. Um, so I did tap this and underline things. I just had a great time with it overall. Another book that I finished in the month of March, I happen to mention a little bit in my mid-month update. And so I'll go ahead and talk about this here. And that is A Stranger or Stranger With My Face by Lois Duncan. And this particular book I picked up kind of on a whim and also because I've been really curious lately about the concept of rereading books because I've been loving my reread of A Song of Ice and Fire. And I've been saying for the last couple of years while I've been on this platform, oh, my reading taste has changed so much. I've been saying that, but has it? That's the question I have for myself because um, I reread this book. I decided as an experiment, I would pick up this book, which I loved when I was around nine or 10 years old. I think it was very formative for me in some ways now that I look back on it. And then I picked it up again later on in life and loved it. And this time I picked it up via audio and I listened to it at one time speed. Now I know a lot of people who listen to audiobooks would find that too slow because audiobook narrators tend to speak very, very slowly, but I was living for every description, every moment of this story. And I say that while at the same time saying, please don't pick this book up <laughs> because honestly, there are some things that are very cringy. Like for example, there's, well, I think it's kind of meant to be a little cringy, but there's this uh, love interest that the, our character has, Lori Stratton. And the guy is kind of a jerk and he looks at her when they're having a romantic moment. He says, you have an interesting mouth. I'm going to do something about it before he leans in to kiss her. It's so cringy. And there's also the, a very key question that our character doesn't ask that is so obvious that her little sister has to point out. It's so obvious that even a kid can point it out. So I know that that would probably annoy some people, but I still love the story. It's about a girl named Lori Stratton. I didn't explain what it's about. It's about a girl named Lori Stratton. She lives on an island on a house on the cliff and overlooking the ocean. And she rides a ferry to school every day. And so she's part of a small community and small group of people, obviously, on this island life. When her boyfriend and their group of friends, the popular kids, the shallow popular kids, that kind of trope, they claim to see somebody who looks exactly like her. They're convinced they see her in different places. She knows she was not. And so this is a mystery that is unraveling. And the other thing too with this particular story is it deals with astral projection quite a bit. And it's really interesting. I wonder if Lois Duncan actually did some research on this topic. I think that, you know, as a kid, I didn't really look deeply at themes, you know, when I was reading back then. But I think this heavily deals with that idea of like, you can't judge a book by its cover. You can't judge a person by how they look on the outside because Lori's friends are the attractive popular crowd and they're very superficial and shallow. Whereas she makes, makes a friend who's from the Southwest who is a true friend, but maybe doesn't look like a typical beauty queen. And she also meets a boy who's like the bad boy outcast who rides a motorcycle and was very handsome until he was in an accident that burned off half, half his face. And he's a very interesting character. And another thing I'll say about this story is that I thought the end was so good. I mean, for me, for my personal reading taste, I still think the end delivers. It was just perfection um, without giving anything away. I don't think anybody should pick this up. I could spoil the end, but I won't. But I just, I loved it. I loved the ending. 
And I loved even the little details like how Lori lives on this house um, on the island and how her dad is a sci-fi writer and her mother is an artist and they work in different parts of the house. And at the end of the day, they meet up in the kitchen and act like they just got home from a long day of work. And it's just so cute the way that that comes together. So I really enjoyed that story, even though it's obviously tied to a lot of nostalgia. And it's still, I still have this question about uh, my reading taste and how it's evolved and how nostalgia plays a role in rereads and that kind of thing. So that's part of an ongoing exploration I'm having. And lastly, I'm sorry if there's background noise. I don't know if that's coming out in this video, but I'll apologize for it now anyway. And lastly, I finished Shogun by Claims James Clavell. And Alan, if you're watching this, I did like this book. He usually watches my videos, I think, when he's playing video games. But I did like this book, Alan. <laughs> um, so this particular story follows a character named Blackthorn. And Blackthorn is an English Protestant who ends shipwrecked in Japan in the year 1600, around then. Of course, this is following the Protestant Reformation. There are Portuguese Catholics who are there in Japan. And they have very greedy motivations as they are making a lot of money off trade deals between Japan and China, which are at odds with one another. And this story has a lot of scheming involved, especially for this title called Shogun, which you'll learn about if you read the story. And I have to say, like, I had some mixed feelings with my reading experience while reading it because I just wasn't that emotionally invested in the plot at least a thousand pages of that kind of plot but I was interested in the characters and the way they transformed and the way that they um, learned from one another when they were from different cultures I loved that there's a lot of exploration on sex and war and on um, death and I loved the exploration on Buddhism and Shintoism which is in this story as well and contrasting that with Catholicism and the Protestant religion as well so it was it was a beautiful ending though i have to say i loved the ending of this story now if you're somebody who was really into the plot of this story and where things seem to be going you might be a little disappointed with how the book ends but for me it was perfect i just loved loved the end i won't say anything more there are things that i did not see coming at the end but for me, it really delivered. It delivered as far as like the experience of understanding that shift in people that can happen. Um, I just thought it was beautifully handled. It really, really was. So this particular story is very dialogue heavy, as I mentioned in my last wrap up. And when I was only two thirds of the way through the story, it's very, very dialogue heavy. And it is an omniscient narration. So you're head hopping quite a bit. And the inner thoughts of the characters are not italicized. They're just written straight on the page. Otherwise, I think like 85% of this book would be italicized because the characters, especially the Japanese in this particular setting, they're very precise with what they say and they never say what they mean, what they're really thinking or feeling, and they never show it in their body language. It's that kind of culture. So that omniscient narration really serves the purpose of giving you the insight of what they're really thinking, what they're really feeling. And I think that it serves a purpose in that way. But if you're somebody who enjoys subtext in the way that you as a reader are trying to infer what characters are really thinking and feeling, this might not appeal to you. There is one character, though, who does keep you guessing as far as what his motivations are. But it's really not that kind of story. Um, so even though I did have kind of a mixed experience with the story, I didn't find myself necessarily gravitating towards it to pick it up. I am very satisfied again with how it ended. I thought it was such a beautiful ending. So overall, I am happy that I finished this and I'm really looking forward to discussing this with Alan and Tori and with Alex. And if you want to hear an excellent spoiler free review of this book, my friend Josh from Red Fury Books did an amazing review of this book and his channel is wonderful overall. So I highly recommend it. Anyhow, those are all the books that I finished in the month of March. So two books that del delivered for me as far as perfect endings, Stranger With My Face and Shogun, <laughs> very different books. And then two starts of trilogies, which I thought were excellent, The Way of Yudan and A Little Hatred. So overall, it was a great month and I'm continuing to examine, of course, my reading taste and whether that's changed and how rereads affect me differently. But that's about it. And I guess one last thing I'll go ahead and mention is I was part of a wonderful discussion over on Philip Chase's channel recently 
on The Gallant by Jenny Wirtz. That's a prequel novella to The Wars of Light and Shadow. And we do discuss, spoiler free, whether you can read that before The Curse of the Mist Wraith or any of those books in The Wars of Light and Shadow. But it was a wonderful discussion and it's made me very excited to continue on in that series. That discussion, by the way, was with Jenny Wirtz and Philip Chase and P.L. Stewart, author of A Drowned Kingdom. And after that, I'm really looking forward to continuing Wars of Light and Shadow. But I just wanted to go ahead and mention it here in case I don't get around to mentioning it. And that was a crazy day. That was the day where we had Why Read episode 11 with Leslie and Andrew um, and the discussion on the way of Edan. It was a wonderful day of discussions. And that's about it. And again, I'll mention that I did start a few other books in March that are carrying over into April. But I will wait until I finish those books to talk about them. I did mention several in my April TBR. There might be one or two that I also started that I didn't mention in that TBR. So you'll see what those are, hopefully, if I finish them in April. That is it for now. Thank you so much for watching and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.